Hello, and welcome to Roadside Florida, the program that takes you back in time to those Florida roadside attractions loved by tourists and locals alike. I'm Renee Ramos, director of the Lynn and Lewis Wolfson II Florida Moving Image Archives. Once again, my co-pilot is historian Sylvia Gorinsky. Today we will be visiting the most magical of kingdoms, Walt Disney World. We like the historical side of things, so we'll take a look at developments in Florida's past that paved the way to what's been referred to as the happiest place on earth. Here's some archival footage to help us get this show on the road. After World War II, Florida began a period of growth that really hasn't stopped. It began with war veterans who'd trained in the Sunshine State. Many decided to move back to Florida with their families into the homes and apartments that were being built. Retirees from the Northeast and Midwest also began making their way south to new adult communities. A variety of businesses began to call Florida home and diversify what had primarily been an economy dominated by agriculture. A major catalyst for growth became reality in 1957 with the construction of the Sunshine State Parkway a.k.a. Florida's Turnpike. Its path into Central Florida triggered interest from Walt Disney, who was looking for a new home for his next project. To tell us more about Walt Disney World, here's Sylvia Gorinsky. Welcome back, Sylvia. Thank you, Renee. It's very good to be back. Well, it's good to have you back. So, Sylvia, um, you were mentioning in, in, in that intro um, about the World War II veterans that mm -hmm. came uh, to Florida and settled here and, yeah. and, and made a home. What was it that, that brought them here to Florida? <laughs> Orders, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> first of all, uh, during World War II. And they would train literally on the beach. They stayed in hotels uh, that uh, were um, used by the U.S. military. Uh, but then they fell in love with the area. They fell in love with the weather. Uh, so they decided to come back to, uh, either for vacations or to stay. And did they just stay in, in any particular part of Florida or were they all over the state? Uh, they were largely in southeast Florida uh, early on. Miami Beach certainly had uh, great success in the post-war era. Uh, but they could diversify because of uh, a lot of these other roadside attractions mm -hmm. we've been talking about through this series. Well, speaking of roads and the roadside, uh, you mentioned the turnpike, and so the turnpike mm -hmm. was also a critical <laughs> factor in, in really building Florida and, and, and creating yeah. a lot of development. What, what was the, the, the role in, in its development as far as you could see? Well, um, one of Florida's governors, uh, Fuller Warren, was actually instrumental in nudging the turnpike from exclusively East Florida into Central Florida. Uh, where there was less going on at the time. And that would prove crucial, uh, again, in Disney's decision-making because he got uh, wind of more being available for that. Uh, and, of course, it was a place that um, millions of drivers were eventually going to go to and to explore other parts of the state. So what were the other roads at, the, at that time? Uh, because it, I, I would imagine they were smaller and less capable roads. Yeah, there were some I-95. Uh, Interstate 4 would also uh, be um, completed in the 1960s, the road that goes from about the Cape Canaveral area, the Space Coast, uh, through Orlando to Tampa. And that was also uh, almost as important as the Turnpike. So the intersection of those two really mm -hmm. became what yeah. was critical for the development yes. of oh, Disney. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. And then as this show is about roadside, you know, the roadsides are always at the core of, of what mm -hmm. we do and what we're looking Absolutely. at. Absolutely. <laughs> well, Florida is no stranger to large land deals for property out in the middle of nowhere. But a real estate mystery of epic proportions was brewing in central Florida that piqued everyone's curiosity. Let's have a look. During the early 1960s, a mystery was taking place in Central Florida, near Orlando. Someone, or maybe a few someones, was buying thousands of acres of land. Who could it be and why? Speculation centered on everyone from the auto companies to the mob. Disney was just one on a list of prospective mystery buyers whose land had names such as Bay Lake Properties and Reedy Creek Ranch. Florida Governor Hayden Burns finally brought an end to the mystery October 25, 1965 with an announcement in Miami that Walt Disney was the mystery buyer of all that land. 
Details were soon to follow. Well, that's very interesting. Sylvia, all of this mystery, what was all of that about? Why, why the mystery? Uh, Walt Disney didn't want to tip his hand, basically. He had started actually looking in the late 1950s for another place because uh, he thought the area in Anaheim around Disneyland was kind of honky-tonk. There wasn't space to do all the things he wanted to. He started looking in the Midwest. He started looking in other parts of Florida and finally found a lot of cheap land in central Florida. So was there any significant opposition to the project? Were, or were there any groups or anybody that was, was advocating against it, as far as you know? Uh, the biggest concerns were probably stated by environmentalists uh, because uh, this was happening at the same time as the environmental movement, particularly uh, the quest for what would become Biscayne National Park. Everglades clean up those two things and also uh, things in other parts of the state uh, started during the early 1960s. So those were the primary concerns that were stated. Uh, there were some concerns from agriculture interests. Agriculture was the big industry in this part of Central Florida at the time. Although some of the agriculture interests were the ones who sold their land to Walt Disney. Mm -hmm. What was, what was the actual environmental lay of the land in that part of Florida at that time? Um, <clears throat> various, uh, there, were, there were a lot of wetlands uh, where Walt Disney bought. And in fact, uh, there were some head scratchers early on because they were looking at the land and saying, what is Walt Disney going to do with this? Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, memories of the 1920s when uh, the expression used to be, I have some swamp land, I'll, tell, I'll sell you in Florida. Right. Uh, and people wondering if Walt Disney had actually bought it. <laughs> so at that point, the turnpike had already come through. Mm -hmm. So it was really just a matter of time and the handwriting yeah. was kind of on the wall yes. as far as development yes. starting to happen. Yes, uh, and um, there were documentaries that were done, documentary films uh, of uh, Orlando, I think one of which the Wilson Archives actually has that shows what Orlando looked like in the days before Disney World. Quite different uh, started. than Very it does different. now. Yeah. And there were actually quite a few white collar industries there as well. Of course, it's famously the birthplace of uh, Tupperware, uh, among others. We're taking our first break, but when we come back, we'll travel back in time to the construction and grand opening of the amazing Walt Disney World. Stay tuned. And now, a television commercial blast from the past. Miami-Dade College has career paths in anything you want to be. What's your story? Be global. Be cutting edge. Be inventive. Be investigative. Be a hero. What do you want to be? Be the best. Be you. Be MDC. Welcome back to the Walt Disney World edition of Roadside Florida. Well, at long last, the time came to clear up the mystery and clue everyone in on what was going on in Central Florida. Here's a clip of the fateful day in 1965 when the mystery was solved. On November 15, 1965, Walt Disney, along with Florida Governor Hayden Burns, met the Florida press. And uh, we hope that uh what we develop here will be a, a real credit to the state, a credit to the Disney organization. We uh, hope that we could build something that would command the respect of the community. 
And uh, after 10 years, I feel that we've accomplished that. Not only the community, but uh, the country as a whole. And that is actually what we hope to do here, is to really develop something that, uh, well, it's just more than an entertainment enterprise. It's, uh, it's something that uh, contributes in many other ways. This concept here will have to be something that is unique and uh, so that there is a distinction between Disneyland in California and whatever Disney does. I notice I didn't say Disneyland in Florida. Whatever <laughs> Disney does in Florida. I have made the appraisal that this is the most important day in the progress and the future development of this state. I know of no single thing in history that could have made the impact that the establishment of a Disney facility here will make. Sylvia, tell me a little more about the state government's interest in, in uh, supporting this massive project. What was, what was their interest in, in supporting it and, and, and uh, basically this development in the middle of nowhere and, and Disney's interest in, in, in doing this in the middle of nowhere? <clears throat> Yeah, Disney's interest was certainly uh, what he had said about uh, the blessing of space, having the land to do everything he imagined uh, for Walt Disney World, for Disney World as he called it at the time, uh, that he had not been able to do with Disneyland. For the state, it was simply a matter of economics. Uh, tourism was and is the number one industry in Florida. And they were always thinking of ways to improve it. Uh, there were their beaches, of course, and there were uh, the smaller roadside attractions, but this was going to be something else again. So up until that time, I would say the really big touristy, tourist attraction kind of place was in South Florida, was Miami Beach and, yes. and that area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I, I, I think we have some sense of there was a, a little bit of concern on the part of folks in, in Miami Beach and in South Florida about this great big tourist oh, yeah. attraction that was mm -hmm. gonna be happening in Orlando. What, 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 what sense do you have of, of how that went over? There's, there's always been somewhat of a competition uh, between South Florida and Disney World, although uh, they have a more symbiotic relationship. They've had recently, for example, uh, the cruise combinations, the cruise Disney World combinations that you have today. Uh, but they didn't think of it quite that way in the 1960s. The late 1960s was when uh, Miami Beach was actually starting to have some struggles in terms of attracting tourists. The Grand Hotels had been opened, the Fountain Blue and Eden Rock in the 1950s, and there would be a long drought until uh, new hotels were constructed in Miami Beach. Uh, the Art Deco uh, area had not been rediscovered as yet. It was considered a crumbling low-income place. So along comes Walt Disney, and he's going to build 200 miles to the northwest, and uh, that was uh, a serious concern for them. So we went from uh, maybe competition uh, in the beginning to more cooperation mm -hmm. with the cruise lines yes. and what have you. Yes. Well, the Disney World Disney Company is well known for its extreme attention to details, with obsessive planning for everything from top to bottom of their properties. Let's learn about some of the planning that took place for the Magic Kingdom. Roll that footage. Soon the project was being called Disney World, but it would have to proceed without its creator. Walt Disney died in December 1966. Disney, who started as an artist, painted a general picture of what Disney World would look like. The reality was left to his Imagineers, the staff who would create, design, and build. Some of the attractions in California's Disneyland would be duplicated or transferred to Disney World. Others would be created specifically for the Florida project. What Walt Disney had called the blessing of size enabled the planning of a theme park that included hotels and connections to other parts of the land. Disney World was intended to take advantage of its Central Florida location and the countless people who would come by car. Sylvia, who were these Imagineers that we hear about so much and, and, and what, what, what were their capabilities and how was it that they were able to take uh, this vision of, of uh, Walt Disney, the man, and, and turn it into this reality? Well, the, the uh, concept of Imagineers had started, of course, many years before and the public's first exposure was through the movies, uh, starting with Steamboat Willie. 
uh, particularly with uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, uh, Fantasia, etc. It started with his artists and spread uh, as he got into more ventures through television, then Disneyland, and the Imagineers uh, became those people who designed the theme parks, first designed Disneyland and then started to design Walt Disney World and came up also with uh, the ride such as It's a Small World and Carousel of Progress that had been done at the 1964 World's Fair in New York. They just, uh, uh, the world was their canvas and mm -hmm. they would express it through different ways, whether through artwork, audio animatronics. They were also able to use improving technology through the mm -hmm. years and, and continue to do so to this day in the Disney theme parks. So there were some other families that carried, family members that carried on after mm -hmm. Walt's passing. Yes. Yeah, particularly Roy Disney uh, in the early years after Walt Disney's 1966 death. And he was the person who really carried Walt Disney World to its opening in 1971. And in fact, sadly, he died not long after Walt Disney World's 1971 opening. But he was able to push uh, that dream forward. So even in uh, the absence of the creator, the, the, the vision went on? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, it continued. Uh, and uh, it really uh, became what a lot of people had imagined, what the Imagineers had imagined. Well, it's time to take another break. But after this short intermission, we'll look at construction footage of the Magic Kingdom, as well as opening day. Don't go away. We'll be right back. <laughs> And now, another television commercial blast from the past. What a great time. Our little guy sure conquered this kingdom. This winter, let Eastern Airlines put some sunshine in your life at Walt Disney World in Florida. You see, Eastern is the official airline of Walt Disney World. Pluto, Pluto, come meet my mommy and daddy. You guys didn't miss a thing. Dad, were you scared? Yep, good thing I have a son like you to protect me. Let Eastern help you find more enchantment there with more vacations than anyone. You know what? You're a terrific father. Eastern, we've got your sunshine. Miami-Dade College has career paths in anything you want to be. What's your story? Be global. Be cutting edge. Be inventive. Be investigative. Be a hero. What do you want to be? Be the best. Be you. Be MDC. Welcome back. We're focusing on Walt Disney World in this special edition of Roadside Florida. Let's continue with a look at the construction of Mickey Mouse's home sweet home in the middle of undeveloped Central Florida scrubland. The reality of Central Florida's greatest project coming to life was left to Tallahassee. In 1967, Florida Governor Claude Kirk signed the bill that created the Reedy Creek Improvement District, which has since been the governing body of Walt Disney World. Construction could finally start but despite the hopes of Roy Disney, Walt's brother, that the theme park could be complete by 1970, the scale of the project and the legal work pushed that deadline back a year. Still, everyone got to look at the progress of Walt Disney's masterpiece. It wasn't Tinkerbell's pixie dust, but the work of thousands of construction workers, painters, carpenters, technicians, and more that brought Disney World to life. So Sylvia, Tell me about this Reedy Creek Improvement mm -hmm. District. Was this a city, a county, uh, a corporation? What was it? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> all of the above. Uh, and it was really the first of its kind municipal uh, creation f as the governing body for Walt Disney World, uh, certainly in the state of Florida. And it, Walt Disney had uh, wanted uh, control over what he could do. This went back again to the issues and the frustrations that he had with Disneyland. 
So he was determined to have as much control as he possibly could in what was to come with Disney World. Uh, and uh, we'll talk uh, more about uh, the other projects that he had in mind, but uh, that was the key. He wanted control. And the Reedy Creek Improvement District is basically a municipal government, and it has a board of directors. Uh, they meet and uh, they determine everything from setting uh, the fees to uh, water and utility deals to uh, even uh, what buildings get constructed, uh, possibly even schools in the area. <laughs> so when we look at the, uh, the whole controversy here in South Florida with the America Dream Mega Mall, they could only dream of having that much uh, control over, over over all of the factors in creating a, a large park like Disney. That's always the goal for these projects. The American Dream Mall now uh, that's being discussed in South Florida and 20 years ago Wayne Heisinger trying to build Blockbuster Park uh, including a ballpark at the time for the Marlins and they want uh, and wanted similar structures similar governing structures to what Walt Disney World has. Brick by brick the park rose from the ground like magic until the big day arrived. The Magic Kingdom was now reality, ready to thrill children of all ages. Let's jump into our archival time machine and travel back to opening day. At last, October 1st, 1971 arrived, Walt Disney World's opening day. About 10,000 people entered the park that day. Since Imagineers were still putting on various touches, the official opening, including the dedication by Roy Disney, took place later that month. Guests were wowed by the technology and varied attractions. What was now the Magic Kingdom offered places that recalled great moments in history and prospects for the future. Walt Disney had said that his project would never be finished. Indeed, Disney World's first decade saw the addition of Space Mountain and what was then known as the Lake Buena Vista Shopping Village. Walt Disney World also included thousands of acres of land turned into an environmental preserve. So Sylvia, how was Walt Disney World received in those opening days and in, in those first few years? And I, I know there must have been a huge amount of anticipation leading up to the opening. So what was it like when it finally opened? It sounds odd to say that there were, I guess, compared to today, only 10,000 people in the park on that opening day in 1971. It was received warmly, but curiously, even as it supplanted other tourism attractions, Bush Gardens and Cypress Gardens were the two biggest uh, in Florida at the time, uh, it still had to uh, have kind of a slow rise through those early years. It mm -hmm. wasn't until later. Uh, and particularly after the construction of Epcot Center and uh, the, coming back, the comeback of Disney movies, really, which had a low period during the 1970s, that you'd really have uh, Disney World becoming the megapolis, I guess, for lack of a better term, that we know today. So that's about when you and your family went there for the first time, right? Yeah, I, my, I know my you... first visit was in 1973. Uh, I wasn't five years old yet. And uh, I just loved it from the very beginning. Uh, adored uh, riding on Dumbo and going to see the Country Bear Jamboree and all of those things. I just have uh, a lot of wonderful memories associated with different places, even with different foods mm -hmm. eaten there and different uh, locations, different rides with my family. Uh, had a chance to go with my parents and my sister in those early years. We have a lot of wonderful pictures and uh, some artifacts, uh, souvenirs that we brought back. Uh, we have a hat here on the table. Yeah. It's one of these uh, artifacts. And um, there's nothing like it. I mean, it really, one has to experience it, particularly a child. And I don't know if the experience because of the changes that have taken place uh, is the same today as it was uh, back in the uh, early years of Disney World. Certainly not with the prices. <laughs> no, maybe not with the prices, but there is some enduring magic there, and it, they seem to have created something really special. Yes. Oh, yeah, always. I mean, everybody always says, every child always says, I want to go to Disney World. <laughs> well, that's all for this edition of Roadside Florida. 
Roadside Florida features historical film and videos from the Lynn and Lewis Wolfson II Florida Moving Image Archives. To see more from the Wolfson Archives collection, visit our website at wolfsonarchives.org. You can search the archives catalog and watch videos online. And be sure to connect to our YouTube channel, where you will find hundreds of carefully curated clips or link to Wolfson Archives Facebook page to keep up with our busy calendar of historical happenings. I'm Rene Ramos. Until next time, thank you for watching.